now that we've broken our castles in Dungeons and Dragons, can we save them? And the answer is an emphatic yes, but not how you think. Hello, my name is Guy and you're watching How To Be A Great GM. Today we're looking at the second part of our series on how Dungeons & Dragons breaks castles. It's not specifically Dungeons & Dragons either that's at fault. Most fantasy settings have the endemic problem of spells just causing our good old-fashioned medieval castles to crumble to the dust. So how do we fix them? How do we change that? Well, that's what this episode is all about, is looking at what would be the perfect castle design in a fantasy setting. So as usual, I've got my list behind me. We've got our T's and C's, we've got the spells, and then we've got the design, because the design of the castle is actually the most important part. The spells, there's all sorts of workarounds and things, and... Um, you'll see just how the design basically means that it doesn't matter what spells you're using. So that really does make a big difference. So stay with me as we go through. All right, so we've got our T's and C's as usual. And so our T's and C's for spells, anyway, so since that's our primary focus. The T's and C's for spells was that they had a duration of longer than five hours. Why that duration of longer than five hours? Well, to be perfectly frank with you, if the castle comes under attack from a magical attack, be that by a mage or a dragon dropping stuff on top of the castle, whatever the cause, if it is a sudden attack, having magic spells up the Yazoo does not help you if you haven't already put them in place. So if it's a sudden attack by a bunch of PCs or by a rogue wizard or a rogue dragon and you've had no time to prepare, the spells won't help you. However... If your spells have been in place for a long, long, long time, then you are prepared, and I will count those spells as being usable and useful to you in terms of defending your castle. So that's the uh, first thing, is the duration. The second thing is access. Now, it's important to note that a lot of comments from the previous video, as well as the discussions I've been having on our Discord server, so if you haven't joined in, us, uh, joined in that Discord server yet, head on over. The link is down in the dibbly doo below. Go and have a look at the um, link there for our Discord. And we've been discussing this exact topic of um, spells and things, and what has come up frequently is access. How accessible is magic in the world, and how expensive is it? Is a level 8 spell something that would require you to be a level 17 caster, or 16 caster, depending on where you are? Would that spell necessarily be ex accessible, and would it be purchasable? Would it be financially viable to use it? So those are some very interesting questions. And what I'm going to be doing, <clears throat> the design of the castle that I will present to you at the end of this video, how I would solve this whole problem, has taken that into account. However, for the purposes of looking at spells in general, we are assuming that there is a lot of magic, it is available for hire, and it can be retained. So castles, large castles anyway, would have a magician, a mage on hand, permanently working for them, going through their daily processes. So those are the terms and conditions in terms of how we're setting out this castle. All right, so now spells. There are three categories that I can think of anyway that the spells fall into. Protection, detection, and attack. There's no point in having a castle if you can't detect what's going to break into it and once it's broken in, if you can't detect where it is. There is obviously lots of reasons to protect your castle and then attacking your castle. The idea primarily of defensive structures was A, to protect those that are inside, we've got that, B, to deter anyone from trying to get to your treasure because there were so many obstacles in your way that it was almost impossible for you to do without being detected. And then finally, to make it so, so difficult for a protracted duration to unfold. So in other words, how would you attack the enemy? Would you have tiered walls, such as the famous castle of Minas Tirith from the Lord of the Rings, which had multiple tiers that could all rain down damage onto the enemy so that the siege couldn't last that long? What's your approach to attacking and counterattacking once the attack on your castle has begun? 
Is it attacking? Is it turtling? Are you just going to sit in your castle and survive? So when we look at the spells, and I've got them, I, I'm, I'm still very old-fashioned. I have them on paper, so forgive me here, because there's quite a lot of them. When we look at protection, protection is things like arcane lock. Now, it sounds like a very basic spell, but arcane lock lasts until it is dispelled, and it's a level 2 spell. Now, what that does is it makes it difficult for thieves to move around your castle, so saboteurs trying to place explosives don't have as much freedom as, you, as they might like. You can really, really control what is locked and what isn't locked and for whom, etc., etc., etc. So there's that loyalty factor that comes in with something like arcane lock. Um, in terms of protections, so that's arcane lock. You've then got uh, forbiddance. For example, Forbiddance lasts a single day unless you cast it 30 times, in which case it becomes permanent. Well, that's that's great. It's a very high level spell. It's level six. So, well, I suppose not high level. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a higher level spell, let's put it that way. It does protect a quite large area. So in theory, if you had years to set up your castle, if your castle wasn't attacked within the first six months or so of your construction, you could cast Forbiddance. Now, Forbiddance prevents all kinds of teleportations and things happening in and around the castle space that has been forbidden. Hallow is another example. That's only a level 5, and that lasts until dispelled. And that's another example of sort of preventing things from coming into that space. So that's all protection type of magic. You've then got, to a degree, you've got things like Glyph of Warding, which is level 3, again, until dispelled. That can do all sorts of interesting things. You've got Symbol, again, until dispelled. Um, so you can do those kinds of things. Uh, th they allow you to encant and do uh, release certain magics upon triggering. So uh, they also, by the way, fall into detection, because you can have them release a sound or a warning sound or uh, slow down people. So... Those two sort of fall into the protection category as well. Protection, obviously, you've got things like Alarm. That's only a level one spell. It lasts for eight hours. The mage, if you have a resident mage, could wander around the castle and go to the choke points, the entry points within your castle, and simply cast Alarm on them and forget about it for the rest of the day. Or if you're more worried about night attacks, they could do it at night. So Alarm is a really powerful spell in terms of warding your castle. Castles can be big, so that's something that we're going to have to take into account when we are doing our design of our castle is the access points need to be alarmed. They need to be controlled in a certain way. Guards and wards, of course, is a level 6 spell. It lasts for 24 hours for so that same mage. He casts alarm. He casts guards and wards. Um, he wanders around. He maybe does a little bit of forbiddance every now and again. So he's going to have a very busy day. He is definitely going to have a very busy day. But... Um, not 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 terrible, not too long. Um, Mirage Arcana is another one that you can cast. Now, it's not so much detection or protection. It's a, well, it's a Mirage. It lasts for 10 days. But what a wonderful way of disguising your castle. So you kind of protected from attacks if you block out where the turrets are, if you change the shape of the terrain around the castle. Those are some wonderful options in terms of protection and detection, in the opposite way of detection, I should suppose you could say. Then in terms of attack, again, we go back to things like your Glyph of Warding. It can be an attack against the characters as they move through somewhere. It lasts for a long time, so until dispelled. Cast Glyph of Warding on each room as you go through. When someone who's not part of the castle entourage walks into this room, explode or release an annoying sound. You can load spells and things into these things. Um, Symbol does very much the same kind of thing. So there are those kinds of spells. When we get to attack spells, now obviously you've got protection in terms of, say, Wall of Wind, which is temporary. It doesn't last as long as it doesn't fall into our category of a long duration spell. So I'm not going to look at those kinds kinds of attacks. I'm going to look at attacks that can last for a long period of time and cause significant damage to a large area. In other words, I'm looking at spells that are going to make sure that the enemy army, if there is an army, is going to pay for every day they stay anywhere near my castle. And the very first spell, and it's really the only spell on this list because of its duration, is Control Weather. 
Now, there were some wonderful, wonderful, wonderful ideas that came through in terms of, oh, well, we'll just cast rain everywhere. We'll get the ground nice and soggy. You know, that's going to cause the uh, the rock to, well, the sand to turn into mud. So it's going to make it easier to destroy walls and those kinds of things. With control weather, you can quite literally bring about thunderstorms, obscure line of sight for archers and baluster and catapults and all those kinds of things. You can do a whole lot of things with control weather. And it lasts for eight hours. So that's a really, really powerful spell. It's level eight, obviously, so it's gonna it's gonna take a lot of magic to do it, but you've got a caster wandering around casting forbiddance and those kinds of things anyway. So if you're gonna have a cast, you might as well go for the best. So control weather controls quite a nice large area. It allows you to create incredible conditions. Imagine if you made it incredibly hot as in, say, 40 degrees Celsius, uh, which is about, what, 120, 130 Fahrenheit in the shade. Those armoured warriors of yours are not going to be wearing very much armour. I come from a country where that temperature is frequently reached. And let me tell you, even wearing a simple leather tabard gets too much for you. And you can quite literally pass out from the heat. You literally dehydrate yourself into a coma and that's it. Your army is gone. So you don't have to just do something like wind and lightning and thunder and those sort of things. You can make it the exact opposite. Um, there's that fable, Aesop's fable, about the wind and the sun and trying to get the man to take his coat off. Uh, if you don't know that, go and have a look and enlighten yourself as to, to that. Okay, so those are the spells that I would use because they last for such a long time. Um, and that's pretty much it. I mean, with that, you've locked down the space. No one can teleport into your space. No one can move around your space without you knowing about it. And when they do, you can actually deal some damage to them. And then you can control that siege area. So sieging a castle, so taking a castle, once you start looking at the counter spells to all of the attacking spells, starts to become dangerous. Now, something that I just want to clarify very quickly is Earthquake was recommended as being one of the greatest spells in terms of attacking a castle. However, Earthquake only goes down 10 feet into the ground. It specifically says it creates ditches 10 or trenches 10 foot deep. That's not even going to get into the basement of the castle. So I don't see it as being as effective as perhaps it could be. If Earthquake was a proper magnitude 7 Earthquake, very different story. But we're going to come to that a little bit later on. Okay, so now we get to the design of the castle. And here is where it is very interesting, I think anyway, to spend, oh, I don't know, about two or three or four days, months, years, weeks, doesn't really matter, it's entirely up to you, researching the evolution of castles in our own world. Now, we don't have magic, but we do have something that's pretty damn close explosive shells. The evolution of castles has obviously changed over time, but for several thousand years it was pretty much the same. A giant stone wall with more stone walls behind it generally kept you safe, and sieging and starvation was your primary enemy that uh, would cause you to actually sacrifice your castle. Physically assaulting and taking the castle when it was a giant stone castle was very seldom successful. All of that changed, all of it changed, the moment that gunpowder started to be added to our repertoire. Cannonballs suddenly started to make those lovely straight stone walls redundant. Uh, stone shatters on impact, so what happens is the entire wall fractures. So we shifted to using brick, which I discovered, although brick does shatter, the individual brick that's hit shatters. The rest don't. They have a very, very good absorption property. So... Brick is better against cannonballs than stoners. I didn't know that. Well, now I do. Moving forward, once the cannonballs started to slam into the walls and then explode, once we started to work out how to put explosives inside those cannonballs, high-yield explosives as opposed to low-yield explosives, which is gunpowder. Gunpowder is low-yield. High-yield are things like trinitroglycerin. Dynamite, basically. Once we started to pack explosives into the shells, walls became completely redundant. We actually started to move away from walls altogether. And so now, in the modern day and age, where we have drones that can fire giant explosive missiles across terrific distances, 
We don't believe in walls at all in terms of conventional protection. The USA is not building giant castles all over the place. Russia does not have giant castles along its borders. They have walls that's to prevent the average person from walking across their borders. But they don't have giant castles anymore. Why? Well, because they're susceptible to these highly, highly explosive attacks. My thinking is, is that that is a similar parallel to how magic really influences the battlefield. If you think about it, magic is a very large destructive force. Disintegrate, earthquake, all those kinds of wonderful spells. So that's going to influence our design shape, isn't it? I think so, anyway. Then you look at the, the thinking behind why castles were put up in the first place. And, well, the four things that I came up with was basically these ones. And I'm going to have to get out of the way because the word is so big, isn't it? It's a huge word. You have to protect. Point number one. Point number one. You're protecting your castle. You're protecting the people inside your castle. And in theory, you're protecting the area around your castle by having a giant castle that can house a garrison and that looks big and dangerous. Compartmentalization. The whole idea of an outer bailey and an inner bailey, those are the courtyards in between all of the different curtain walls that extend out from the center of the keep. So you've got all those ring walls, those, those baileys which sit in between, that's the territory that was in between. All of that was to compartmentalize enemy. You got over wall, wall number one. Fantastic! You've still got three more walls to get over, and whilst you're trying to get over the second wall, we're still firing down on you. So by compartmentalizing your enemy, you are making them more vulnerable to your attack and you're controlling where they go. Now, if you haven't watched the video on the Hamanlina castle that I did, you'll notice that they're very narrow, very, very small corridors, very, very small spaces. Gone are the five foot wide passageways, by the way. They're probably more like three and a half to four foot, if anything. Well, maybe I need to get a bit smaller. Identification. This was a major problem. And generally, generally, in most fantasy games, in most fantasy TV shows, in most things, identification is the reason why the heroes get by. You pull a cowl over your head and suddenly you're Clark Kent. Nobody recognizes you. So identification is a major factor. And that requires basically people on the ground scanning everyone coming through so that they don't notice that you're Robin Hood and you have a giant quiver of arrows on your back as you walk into the castle. So identification, that's point number one. Point number two is that people could look up and go, oh, look, that's a lord. How do you know he's a lord? Well, he's not covered in shit. I mean, well, he's not, um, he lives in that big castle over there. He's got to be a lord. He's got to have lots of money. So they can identify the leaders of the realm. They can identify where the power of the realm sits. And if you take over a castle, generally, you're considered now the lord of that land that the castle owned. That's just how it works. Conquest gives you the right to control that land. Again, also, traditionally in warfare, the peasantry were used as soldiers, absolutely. But the idea of going in and slaughtering every single peasant in the village generally didn't happen unless you were there to obliterate the nation. Now, obliterating the nation is very different from invading the nation. The Romans didn't go around slaughtering absolutely everybody. They slaughtered anyone who stood in their way, but if you stood by the side and welcomed them in, they eventually turned you into a Roman. That's because killing off the peasantry is not a smart idea. Who's going to produce all that grain for your army next year when you try and advance even further out into new territory? You need the peasants. So generally speaking, the peasants are not the ones that get attacked during invasions. Generally speaking, it's only the lord and his lady and the family that will get executed. And that brings me to prestige. I'm so far away. Prestige. Now, prestige is the main driving force behind our architecture, as a matter of fact. Building bigger, taller, higher area spaces has been motivated in our human history predominantly by prestige. Peasants, you live in a single story hut. If you're lucky, maybe you've got a little latch onto your roof and then you can sit on your roof and enjoy your free half hour before work 
commences. But generally speaking, the richer you were, the bigger your structure. We only have to turn to medieval Europe to see that the cathedrals, which drove our architectural understanding of the Gothic arch versus the Romanesque arch, and I can talk about that for days and I'm not going to, the entire reason why cathedrals got bigger and bigger and bigger was because the bishops were competing to see who could build the biggest structure, so the prestige was there. They wanted to be able to be identified as the most powerful people in the land. We have cathedrals that are bigger than your castles. And they're prettier too. We're much, much, much better than the local ruling party. They wanted to compartmentalise. I'm sorry, you can't stay in a monastery, you're not a monk, you're not religious, go away. You can't stay in this giant cathedral because you're not a bishop, go away. They wanted to protect their status as well, but they wanted to show how much power and money they had and build these magnificent structures. There was obviously a religious component too, and I'm sure certain bishops actually were trying to show their veneration and love of the god that they worship. Generally speaking, though, it was to show off who had the most money. So with all of that, with that gigantic preamble, and I'm watching the time here, and we're not doing too badly, we're not doing too badly. With all of that, we then say, so what should a castle in a fantasy setting look like, where we've got things like disintegrate, earthquake, move earth, stone shape, dimension doors, forbidden hallows, Symbol. We've got all of this wonderful magic at our disposal, as well as flying creatures, trebuchets, catapults. It's been recommended that the trebuchets have a siege mode, which allows them to do even more damage against structures and those kinds of things. It is a way of mitigating the high hit points of walls and things. Oh, that's wonderful. What do we do against that, where we have all of this powerful magic? Well, I happen to have, and I am hopefully this is going to work, Without being a disaster, I'm going to turn off that be gone, and I'm going to bring back what I think a perfect castle looks like. And I want you to just look at it for a moment and contemplate what it looks like. Now, what I'm going to show you is the side view of what this structure would look like. The side view. And I'm going to talk you through it, so don't panic. I think... I'm going to move out of the way. I think... The perfect castle for any kind of fantasy setting is this. That is what I think the perfect castle for a fantasy setting is. This is a giant hole in the ground. I'm going to try my weatherman effect here. This is a hole. This is a giant trench. The castle is sunk into this gigantic hole. It's a cavernous space. We then have here and here little protection walls. Maybe they're 10 foot high. Maybe they're 20 foot high. Let's be daring. These walls serve as no function other than allowing us to shoot down oops, onto these lower walls. Now, these lower walls here and here behind me, they are made out of stone for sure. There's a central triangular piece of stone. You can see that there where my horridly crooked fingers are pointing. But in front of them is this redoubt of earth, sand, clay, not stone. And there's a wooden wall on top of that. A little, yeah, maybe seven foot tall wooden wall. In front of that you can have a moat if you like. You don't really have to. It doesn't make much difference because these sloped walls, these sloped walls here and here, the sand is a great absorber of damage. Now, during basically the Renaissance period, right the way up to World War I, building your walls with a little bit of a, a little bit of a wall behind it, and then a sloped, sloped sand, uh, sloped earthen works in front, was considered the most effective way at mitigating cannonball fire. What happened was the cannonball would just simply thump into the earth and do very little damage. What then, of course, your problem was that troops could then run up this nice little hill that you'd made and then they could attack the wall that um, was being protected by it. Again, though, remember, this is not this is not a game of we take the castle in 10 minutes and we're done. There is nothing like that happening. This is going to take a long time if we're attacking with a large force. If we've got mages throwing disintegrate. Excellent. You've disintegrated 10 foot of sand. It took me... 
half a day with a dozen peasants to build that wall. It cost me nothing. And now you've got to the first bailey. That's this little area in between the tower behind me. That's the tower there and the wooden wall over there. You've now got to the first bailey. I've got this wall here, which is now raining fire down on you. And I will show you the firing patterns as we get there. Once you got through this wall, ha ha! Where is the castle? It's underneath you. So now your options are to basically jump down here and fall all the way down into this pit at the very bottom or to try and shimmy down and get in through here. Alternatively, you could try and get in through our single entry point on this side or on that side there, right there. I'm going to bring them up now. Our entry points. Let's just see. Uh, entry points. Bingo. Okay, so these crosses represent the entry points uh, into this castle. So I'm going to put in some little structures here. So we've got uh, little wooden balconies. These don't necessarily re uh, represent every single story within the castle. These four compartments, if you like, they don't necessarily represent four stories. They could be 80 stories in there. It doesn't really matter. But the idea is that you would have little wooden balconies because you need a light well. And that's what this great big hole is, this blue strip behind my hand. It's a light well. It's allowing light to filter into this castle because otherwise you're going to have a very gloomy castle. Point number two is that we still rely on firewood to warm the castle. So the chimneys need to exhale that smoke out of this central territory. And so those are the two primary functions of having this giant well here. Um, and of course, rainwater coming in allows you to collect rainwater and so on and so on. So these are our entry points. There, through that wall there, and there, through that wall there. There are, just below here, two little exit points. Whoa, sorry, sorry. Two little exit points, one there. This tunnel leads to maybe a mile or three away to an external point. And the same with the tunnel on this side. It goes off, that tunnel goes off indefinitely to another exit over there. Effectively, though, you have one, two entry points, maybe four, into the actual structure itself from the traditional conventional means. Now, these would be, um, sorry, let's go here. These would be uh, stairwells that lead into a corridor. The corridor runs down to there, uh, stairwell again, and then it actually runs into here. So this is a major choke point right here where my finger is. Major, major choke point. So your armies, firstly, they have to get past the outer sand wall. Where am I going? They're past the sand wall. They get through that. Then they have to take out this structure here to then get into your little access point, which could actually sit further behind the wall if you really wanted it to. Then they have to come down and they've got to fight their way down. They don't know where they're going. You do. Now, maybe they've done some reconnoitering. They've cast one of those wonderful augury spells or oracle kind of spells and they know where they're going. Doesn't matter. This is a complete zone of death. All those things like glyphs of warding and symbol and law, you just put everything that you could possibly like into that tunnel and they have no other way of getting into your castle. Aha, you say, but they could attack uh, here. It's all reversed. They could attack these slopes, these slopes, these sloping areas behind my hand. They could attack those sloping areas and by that way gain access into these two upper territories up here. Yes, they could. Again, though, once you've blasted open this hole, what are you going to do? You're going to just sort of drop down from there. You're going to drop down. I don't think you're going to just drop down into this. Into this, It's dangerous. It's difficult. So you've slowed them down tremendously. And obviously, each of these little wooden balconies that I've very badly drawn in here would have doorways and things. So they could, in theory, fly in, fly in, and then drop down Mission Impossible style to get to one of these access points. Because you would also need access points at the very bottom of the shaft so that you could send in people to clear out garbage and, and clean up and maintain the gardens or whatever is going to be in that in that particular well. I would also put in a nice, nice and very nasty monster in that well as well. So that people who do just drop in suddenly have to face a gigantic, very angry predator of some kind. 
These could be walkways across uh, this um, the shaft with little rope bridges and things. Obviously, they get cut the moment that a combat happens um, if the enemy are getting to this point. So what we've done is we have significantly reduced the profile of the castle to any kind of sight required magic. You can't suddenly go, oh, I can see it. No, I can't. It's underground. Trebuchets and the like, well, they might be able to get a lucky shot in through this gap here and then hit one of these uh, walls, but they're not going to get all the way down into the lower levels, I don't think. Um, it would be a very lucky shot for that to happen. Uh, I think that would be uh, uh, that would be something that, that's quite, quite special. And even if they did, all they're going to do is maybe collapse in this, this little um, section here. Oh, I really am bad at diagonals. Uh, note to self, don't ever do diagonals. So the, <laughs> this area here uh, could, and this area here, could be subject to, to trebuchets, but it's it's not likely. And I don't think that the damage would do much in terms of allowing troops to gain entry. They still have to get from up there down into there anyway. Further to that, we then start to look at our kill zones. So I'm going to turn on the kill zones one at a time hopefully. No, I'm not. I'm going to turn them all on. Here we go. These are the kill zones that archers, other mages, trebuchets, catapults, whatever you've got loaded into the castle have. Bingo. Look at that. <laughs> it is complete coverage. Absolutely complete coverage. You've got the outer walls, these very far walls, these walls over here, they're shooting down. You've got these higher walls, they're shooting, shooting down, down, uh, down is that way. Uh, they're shooting down, they're shooting down. You've got these uh, diagonals, which I'm not even going to try, the diagonal there. That's shooting upwards, upwards uh, and outwards because there's no reason why it can't. No one is shooting straight up, by the way. I don't like that idea. You've got coverage basically from everywhere, and then you've even got coverage from these side walls down here. They can obviously shoot across uh, at one another in those wonderful comedic moments, but they can also shoot up, up, and sweep across, sweep across this entire area here. So the kill zone, anything flying over, and we've worked out archers have got 600 feet of range, so you've got to be higher than 600 feet because otherwise you will be shot at. You will be shot at. It's it's just absolutely, absolutely insane. The protection that you get, which is far greater from this type of attack than it is from your traditional walls, which basically limit themselves in terms of not being able to shoot straight down. Yes, you can add in murder holes and all those kinds of wonderful things, but this way, the only way to actually get at the castle is where the castle is firing directly at you and destroying you specifically. Now, I don't know about you. I'm going to turn this off now and scroll back down here. I don't know about you, but that looks more like a dungeon than a castle. So the entire idea, and maybe this is what the great visionaries had when they were designing this thing, but the entire idea is that dungeons make far more sense than building castles. But I do hear you. I do hear you. One of our requirements was prestige. Oh, he must be a lord. He lives in the great big hole in the ground, which is not very impressive because it's only got a 20-foot high curtain wall around a ditch, really. He lives in a ditch. He's a cave dweller. That's not prestigious. And we live in a world filled with magic, don't we? So if magic is common enough to allow the, all those spells and things to be thrown around during battle, it means that... Your prestige doesn't come from building giant castles that reach up into the air, but made out of stone. Anyone can cast wall of stone. That's not very impressive. No, your prestige, in my opinion, in a medieval fantasy world, comes from being able to do that. Yes, my wonderful illustration of a castle. That is a permanent illusion of a castle. If you are a lord and you are trying to get prestige, you're trying to show, I have money to burn, I am so powerful and so rich, I don't care about the cost of creating a gigantic illusion which is absolutely as real as you can imagine. 
I will create and maintain this spectacular... Oh, it costs a thousand gold a day to have that illusion cast, don't you know? Had the greatest illusion in the world come and create it for me. It provides nothing but a visual cue, a visual reference and a prestige status because you don't actually want to have a physical structure sitting above your castle. It's going to get bombarded by trebuchets, destroyed by dragons and other dropping creatures that will blow up everything, and pose a risk to your safety, to your identification, and all those kinds of wonderful things that get in the way of protecting your castle. You want it to be an illusion. It has to be something fake that sits on top so that at the command of the captain, drop the illusion. Whew, this trench opens up and your archers can fire with absolute certainty all over everything that's anywhere near the castle. And when the entire event is over, you have to rebuild a sandy wall maybe a small retaining wall, and maybe patch up these diagonals, which I have now finally got right at the very end of the video, of course. But I think an illusion, and casting an illusion so that you can invite guests, come to the castle, you can't miss it. It's that 40-story high um, structure over there. Well, how do you keep this up with physics? I don't. I use magic. Vast, vast amounts of very, very, very expensive magic. We can actually have a dinner in the dining hall. The wall's as solid as possible. Just believe that it's solid and you'll be fine. That is, in my opinion anyway, how I would build a castle in a fantasy world where we've got flying creatures aplenty. I would go down into the ground, and what of the drow and the dwarves that might dig from beneath us? Well, they're still going to only have a single point of entry unless they do multiple diggings, and if you haven't got someone who's heard them digging, and having been on a mining site, I can tell you it's not quiet, if you don't have someone who's monitoring the ground floor, a peasant that you literally pay, you know, 10, 15 copper a day, to sit there with a giant trumpet horn, listening to their floor. If you don't have that, then you've got bigger problems to worry about than an assault from the Underdark. But again, even so, if they attack you from underneath, they still only got one point of entry. They still have to get up now to take the actual castle. Taking the bottom level, well, that's fine, but I've still got my choke points, which are alarmed and warded to the maximum effect, and I think it's actually even more difficult to take it from underneath than it is to take it from the top. Either way, those are my thoughts on how to create the perfect fantasy castle so that you still have magnificent structures that you can describe to your players as they ride up into town. They go, oh, well, that must be where the Lord is. Look, it's a gigantic castle. And the one person with high wisdom goes, I don't, I don't see a castle. I see a ditch. Um, no, no, no castle. No, uh, it might be an illusion. In which case everyone goes, oh, he's really rich then if he can afford to do that for so long. Wow, he must be really powerful. That's how I would do it. How would you do it? Leave your comments below or join us on Discord where we have these great discussions and we look at the merits and we unpack spells and we try and understand exactly where we're going and uh, look at alternatives as well because that's what makes this game so much fun. So the next time you come across a dungeon, don't go, oh, it's such a silly idea. Rather look at it and go, this is perfect. No dragon is going to attack us from the air. No griffin is going to drop a barrel of explosives or an angry barbarian in our midst. This is it. This is perfect. But you have to worry about things like ventilation as well as smoke extraction. Those are important as well because if you don't have those, then you can also be in trouble. Until next time, if you're looking for players or you're looking for a GM, head on over to www.rpgtablefinder.com. That's the website that we've created just for you. That's right. It's pretty much, you can't find it anywhere else. It is through this channel that you will find it. That means that people who are there, and there's over 6,000 subscribed people now, uh, it's a free service, but they, they, they signed up is what I mean. 6,000 people are there who think like you do and watch this channel. Maybe you completely disagree with me, in which case you've got 6,000 people to disagree with, and that would pose a challenge, I think, to anyone. 
either way. It's for people to get together and plan games, find players from all over the world, or locally. You can search within a 50 kilometer or a 20, 25 mile radius um, of you, as well as further out and abroad and that sort of thing. So find real players to sit around a real table, or find virtual players to sit around a virtual table, or real players to sit around a virtual table, or virtual players to sit around a real table, if you have enough technology. Um, either way, you're going to find people out there who think like you do, and who just want to have fun and play the game that we love so much. So go and have a look at that. Until next time, happy games.